called many things. It's been called the, the, the mountaintop of the Christian experience. It's, it's been called the, the, key, um, uh, the key point in the argument of Romans. This, this is a key chapter, and so it's a delight for us to get into it this morning. Uh, can we just pray and then commit it to the Lord as we go into Scripture this morning? Father, it's uh, with thankfulness in our hearts for your kind grace to us and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the fellowship that we have in Christ. Thank you for your servants that uh, minister among us and, uh, and with us. And we do thank you for uh, Dr. Morris and for his long service. And uh, we do pray for comfort for his family. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would grant us your blessing as we open the scripture this morning to uh, the wonderful truths that you have for us. Thank you for your servant, the Apostle Paul. Uh, thank you for these truths that we can both celebrate and, um, and live by. And so we commit our time to you in the word today, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me uh, bring our PowerPoint uh, up onto our, um, our screen. And uh, as you can see, we are in Paul's letter to the Romans, and uh, we are in Romans chapter 8, this wonderful passage which I have entitled, No Condemnation, Living in Christ by the Spirit. No condemnation, living in Christ by the Spirit. The first uh, two words are taken from uh, verse 1, the way in which this chapter opens <clears throat> with this wonderful phrase, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2 says, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Set you free. Freedom. Freedom is a key theme in the Apostle Paul. And, and this theme of freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from condemnation, the freedom that we have in Christ has been a theme that um, people who have preached the gospel over the centuries have underlined and emphasized. This year, 2020, <clears throat> is the 500th anniversary of a set of publications by Martin Luther. Uh, most of you know that in uh, 2017, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. That was when uh, Luther posted the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg and the, those debating points, Theses. Uh, that, that was the spark, looking back on it, that started what we call the Reformation, which was a return to the gospel uh, against a Christianity that had obscured it, that had covered it over with sacramental church practice. In 1520, <clears throat> 500 years ago this year, there were three books that were published by Martin Luther. One was an address to the nobility of the German nation, the Christian nobility of the German nation. The second was a prelude on the Babylonian captivity of the church. In these books, what he was saying was he was alerting um, the people in Germany uh, that um, we need a return to the gospel. And the Babylonian captivity of the church was all about the sacramental system and what this had done to secure, to obscure the gospel. But the third book was entitled The Freedom of a Christian. If you have an opportunity, to, to read that, it would be worth your while, even 500 years later. And in the title, he emphasized the word freedom, the freedom of a Christian. 
Because when we are freed in Christ, we, we're not in a situation of trying to earn our salvation. That's bondage. But we are freed to serve God with a conscience that's freed before God. A lot of what Luther had to say comes right out of this chapter. Let's uh, look here in verse 1. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Therefore, therefore, of course, is the movement in his argument. What has he said? <clears throat> Back in chapters 1 to 3, he spoke of the wrath of God against sin. Culminating in the middle of chapter 3, we're all sinners. But starting in chapter 3, uh, verse 21, but now, there's a transition, but now, God has provided an atonement in Christ Jesus by which our sins are forgiven and by which we're declared right, righteous in God's sight. That's justification. That is a gift of God's grace on the basis of Christ's atonement. So from the middle of chapter 3, all the way into chapter 5, he's developing this justification by faith. And in chapter 5, he ended that chapter emphasizing that just as sin brought condemnation to everybody, the free gift brings justification and life. Well, <clears throat> he spoke about how sin kept increasing but grace kept abounding all the more. What a wonderful term. Even though sin increased, grace abounded even more. And God, by his grace, gives us a right standing before him. But that raises questions. Shall we consent, continue to sin because grace abounds all the more? Well, no, he says, because when you've been put into Christ, you your relationship to God and to sin has changed. And then he says, we're no longer under the law. Well, then the question again is asked in chapter six, shall we continue to sin because we're under, no longer under the law? No, he says, because our relationship to sin and the law has changed. Well, then he asks the question, well, is the law sin? No, it's not. So that takes us to where we were at the end of chapter 7, where we have this long section on the problem. The problem is the problem of sin. It's indwelling sin. It's not just the sins we commit. It's a sin principle. That's the problem. There is a sin principle, and that's why when we're giving the law, we have trouble with it because sin disobeys it. And so this is a, this miserable situation in which we find ourselves brings us right to the end of chapter seven, where he says, chapter seven, verse 24, uh, regarding this sin principle that's in me, he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? from this body of death, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's going to deliver us from this. So we end with chapter 7 with our situation. Um, I'm being, I've been given God's law. I read it. I want to obey it. But there's this sin principle. Now, just a point here, people ask, so Paul's describing the Christian life there, right? A lot of people say he is. I would say, no, if you think that, you're not following Paul's argument. What Paul is describing is the problem of a person who's a sinner being given God's law. Now, we're all sinners, so we're not yet talking about what God's done for us in Christ. We're just sinners, and we're given God's law. The Jews were given God's law. 
They were taught to memorize it, to study it. They wanted to obey it. Paul says, I want to obey it, but I've got this problem of sin in me. And so who is going to deliver me from this? Now, in chapter 8, this is where Paul now begins to talk about the deliverance. He's, he's mentioned it several times, but here we go. So this is how the argument flows. Therefore, now, now in Christ Jesus, now there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You say, yes, we know that. That goes back to chapter 5, the free gift of God's grace. That's justification. We are given a right standing before God. Yes, that's true. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Notice, it's for those who are in Christ Jesus, which is Paul's point. When you put your faith in Jesus, you were united to him. You were placed into Christ. You were given a relationship to him that you didn't have before faith. And now you have to think of yourself as being in Christ. Now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? Because Christ's atonement paid the penalty. And so we have the free gift of justification. But there's more. We have this freedom in Christ. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, this is a little complex here. What he means by law is a principle and a power. This is the way he used the term in chapter 7, verse 21. I find it to be a law that when I do want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I see, verse 23, in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. The use of the word law here is referring to a principle or a power, okay? Paul uses the word law sometimes to refer to the Mosaic law. Sometimes he's referring it to the first five books of the Bible. Here, we're talking about a power and a principle. The law, verse Romans 8, 2, of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death is the principle that when I sin, I am condemned. Paul refers to it several times in chapter uh, 6 and 7 as, uh, as sin killing me. Sin brings death on me. It brings condemnation on me. When I sin, the law of sin is uh, I have this principle of sinning. I sin and I'm condemned. That seems to be a natural consequence of sin, condemnation, and death. But in Christ Jesus, in the same one, in whom we have this legal standing of being right before God, in him is what Paul describes as a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's not just the Holy Spirit, it's the law or the principle or the, the power working of the spirit of of life in Christ Jesus. By the way, the English Standard Version, which you see there on the PowerPoint, which, which I use, uh, has separated the phrase in Christ Jesus <clears throat> from the phrase spirit of life. 
and actually in the Greek, they, they follow one another. And I think it's better to think of it that way. It's the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. It set you free from the law of sin and death. That is the principle that we move from sin to condemnation, <clears throat> sin to condemnation to death. He's been saying in chapter six and in chapter seven, you've been set free. Uh, here he says in uh, chapter six, verse 18, having been set free from sin. He says in chapter seven, uh, we have uh, died in chapter seven, verse six, we have died to that which held us captive. We've been released from the law. We've set, been set free from it. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus is a different living principle than the principle of sin and death. It is the principle by which we serve God with a free conscience without the sense that I have been lost totally before God. Look, the problem at the time of Martin Luther was that you had for centuries this church system that had been built up that thinks that I have to gain my justification, my right standing before God by doing sacraments. That totally obscured the gospel because it obscured personal faith in Christ. It's not sacramental activity. It's personal faith in Christ that makes the difference. Since that time, there has grown up a view that, okay, I put my personal faith in Christ and I'm saved, I'm justified, but then I sin. And so when I sin, then I lose it. Just like the sacramental people lost their sacramental grace when they sinned. And so they have to keep doing sacraments. And so here's a person that they believed in Jesus, and then they sinned, so they lost their salvation. So they have to get it back again, and they sin and lose it again, and then they get it back again. That's the principle of sin and death. Sin means condemnation, means death. In Christ Jesus, Paul is saying, there's a different principle. First of all, there's justification. You're, you're justified before God, and that holds in Christ Jesus constantly. But there's a different principle of living. The principle of living is the principle of the spirit of life. Let's follow Paul as he says that. God did what the law cannot do. What did he do? Uh, first of all, what, what, why, the, why was the law, what was the problem with the law? The problem of the law, just a reminder, I'm a sinner, I have a sin principle, the law comes, and Paul has made a point. We're not saying the law is bad, but what did the law do? The law is a teacher. The law comes to me, and it teaches me. Going back to Deuteronomy 6, Moses said, you're supposed to memorize this. You're supposed to teach this. Everybody's supposed to read this. You're supposed to set your mind to obey this and do everything you can do to walk by this. The law is a teacher. Okay. But the law, verse 3a here, is weakened by the flesh. The law, the teacher can only teach. The law can't change your heart. So God had to step in and do something about this. Look, <clears throat> it's illustrated or it's expressed very well in Isaiah. Isaiah 59 is a very interesting chapter. Isaiah 59 is all about sin. 
Uh, it starts off with that very well-known verse, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save or his ear dull that he cannot hear. It's your iniquities that have made a separation between you and your God. And then he goes on to talk about your iniquities. And they're awful and they're extensive. And this, this is all summed up by Romans 3.23. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's Isaiah 59. Now, you come to Isaiah 59, verse 15. Truth is lacking. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. But right in the middle of that verse, they put the verse number in the wrong place, by the way. Okay. Verse numbers came in in the Middle Ages, you know. They should have put it right in the middle of the verse because that's where the next point starts. Look at that in the middle of verse 15, Isaiah 59. The, law, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice and he saw that there was no man and he wondered there was no one to intercede and then his own arm brought salvation. God stepped in. What a wonderful truth that is. God has done what the law, Paul says, Romans 8, 3, weakened by the flesh could not do. God did it. He stepped in. What did he do? Verse 3, he condemned sin in the flesh. That's what he did. You say, is that good news? That sounds bad news for me. No, that's actually good news. He condemned sin in the flesh and he punished it. See, condemnation is punishment. He, he condemned it and he punished it. This goes back to Romans 3, um, 25. He put forward an atonement by which the sin was punished. He condemned it. And he condemned it and he did this. Look at the first part uh, here. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He sent his own son. What a, what a wonderful statement that is. And how we could spend our whole time just unpacking that. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send a prophet. He didn't send a nice person. He sent his own son. His own son. And he sent him. This is John 3.16. God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Here it is in Paul. Romans 8.3. He sent his own son. He sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus was not a sinner, but he came in our flesh. We're sinners, and, and we have a sin principle in our own flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Romans 5, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin, God made him to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. He came in our flesh and he came for sin. That phrase for sin in the Greek, in the Greek Old Testament uh, is constantly used meaning a sin offering. Uh, that's a sin sacrifice. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, that is as a sin sacrifice that's the point that Paul made back in chapter 3, uh, verse um, 25, that God put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. He's a sin sacrifice. And in that way, God condemns sin in the flesh. And he did that in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, you have to follow Paul's argument. The atonement of Christ is the basis for our legal standing, the forgiveness of our sins and being a, given a legal standing. But also that atonement 
what God did in Christ in Jesus' death and in his resurrection was so that what the law required would be fulfilled in us. Now, it's fulfilled in us in two ways. Number one, it's done. It's finished. It's completed. We're just. That's justification. That's true. That's why our salvation is sure and secure. But Paul is going on because in Christ Jesus, where we have the justification, we have a new principle, the spirit of life. And by the working of the spirit of life, the righteous requirement, first of all, it's fulfilled, that's justification, but it's also brought out in experience that it might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. It's fulfilled completely. That's justification. That's positional sanctification, we call it. But it's also comes to be expressed in our own experience as we walk by the Spirit, okay? Now, he's still unpacking this. Okay, so let, let's keep going forward here. So verses five to eight, he's talking about this living by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. And I've entitled this a contrast of two minds. Okay. Look at verses five to eight. This is the mind according to the flesh. Those who live according to the flesh set their mind on things of the flesh. To set the mind on the flesh is death. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay. We're talking about a manner of living. And this manner of living is one in which the mind is set on the flesh as a principle. And, and the flesh as a principle contains the principle of sin, condemnation, sin, condemnation, and death. When Paul speaks of death here, he's not talking about future death, although that's part of it. It's, we talk about physical death, talk about spiritual death, eternal death. Paul has been talking about death as a mode of existence, which is kind of odd because it's a, like we might all say, a mode of living. Um, he describes this in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That's lived. You were dead in the trespasses in which you once lived. Okay. Which is a whole quality of life. Deadness has several features to it. Number one, it's condemnation and guilt. Number two, it's it's um, the the habit, the habituation of sin character. It's sinfulness. So it's, it's the, the, the deadening qualities of life that Paul considers dark, dead, and um, even describes them as decaying. And they carry condemnation and guilt. When you set your mind on the things of the flesh, then that's what you experience. You experience that quality of living. Notice verse 7. The flesh, th this kind of sum uh, sums up what he was saying at the end of chapter 7 about the sin principle. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law. It cannot. There's an innate 
hostility toward God that belongs with indwelling sin. That explains why in chapter 1, when it says the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteous of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth about God. Why do they do that? Because indwelling sin is hostile. It is a hostile principle against God. You don't fully understand sin unless you understand that it is an innate hostility against God. See, most people think of themselves as morally neutral. Every ethical situation I'm in, I'm a morally neutral person. I have either A, I'm going to do what's right, B, I'm going to do what's wrong, and I'm this morally neutral person choosing between what is right and what is wrong. Paul says, you don't understand the human condition. The human condition has an innate hostility against God, and so when the law comes, it's not a morally neutral person deciding whether or not to do it. There, the, the law aggravates the internal hostility that sins against God. That's the problem. Now, Paul says to, to set the mind. What is setting the mind? Setting the mind is the way you concentrate. Paul talks a lot about setting the mind in Ephesians and Philippians. Uh, in several places, he talks about setting the mind. It's a, a focus. It's a concentration. It is a, um, a thinking of oneself, a seeing of oneself, an understanding, a self-understanding, okay, in many of these passages. So this is a way of understanding yourself in terms of the flesh. And what it doesn't have, it doesn't have any faith in Christ in it. It doesn't have any understanding of being in Christ. This mindset on the flesh is utterly ignorant of Christ. It's utterly um, non-cognizant of Christ. Okay? There's no trust in Christ going on here. Okay. Now let's look. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Those who live according to the Spirit, they do that by setting their minds on the things of the Spirit. Now this is what one has that's in Christ. To set one's mind on the things of the Spirit is to understand one's position in Christ. It is to trust in Christ. It is to, it's what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says, you've died with Christ. If you've died with Christ, set your mind on the things that are above where Christ is. Fix your mind on the things of Christ because that's who you are. Doing that is an act of faith. It's trusting in the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus Christ rose by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 1, what was that? Verse 3, uh, where he says, um, he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection of the dead. It's the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Setting your mind on the Spirit of life is understanding who you are in Christ Jesus, understanding the working of the power of the Holy Spirit in you to conform you to Christ. And you live according to that. Christian empowerment in Christ, verse 9. You are not in the flesh. You see what Christian identity is? Christian identity, first of all, you need to understand who you are in Christ. You're not in the flesh. Say, but I am. I'm right here. I'm, I'm mortal. I've got a fleshly body. I'm in the flesh. Am I not? No, Paul says. You're not. You're actually in the spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in you, okay? 
So faith in Christ has as a component to it understanding who you are, Christian identity. You're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. Notice this little um, similarity here. Uh, he, Paul speaks of us being in Christ, Romans 8, 1, those who are in Christ. But now in 8, 10, he speaks of Christ in you. This is part of understanding Christian identity. To be in Christ is for Christ to be in you. Same thing with the Spirit. You are in the Spirit. The Spirit is in you. You are in the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in you. The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He gives life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. You know, this is the old, the old illustration. You've, many of you have heard it, um, but it's, it goes way back, centuries back in Christian teaching. It's the, uh, you know, this is, this is the time of year we're getting into winter. And so you're going to do your fireplace, okay? You're going you're gonna to start your fireplace up. And you have that little iron poker, you know, that pokes the log in the fireplace. If you, if you leave that iron poker there in the fire, it starts turning red. Okay. And centuries ago, they used that as an illustration. You see, if you put the iron poker in the fire, the fire gets into the poker. <laughs> You put the iron in the fire, the fire goes in the iron. You're put into Christ, Christ is in you. You're put in the spirit, the spirit is in you. There's a new relationship to God when you're in Christ. And here's the key, verse 11. <clears throat> If the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, to pull it all together, if you're in Christ and Christ is in you, if you're in the spirit and the spirit is in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Two ways of understanding that. Number one, that's your future resurrection from the dead right there. He's going to give life to your mortal bodies. That's why if Jesus comes today, we will be transformed directly into immortality. He's going to do that by the same power by which Christ was raised. But there's more. We're talking here about living the Christian life. And the problem of chapter 7 is I'm in the flesh, and I have this law of sin in me, this sin principle that's living in me, and who's going to free me from this? And Paul in chapter 8 is saying there's no condemnation because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. And so here, when I'm facing God's instruction to me, which now comes to me as a child, not, not as, a, as a servant. He's instructing and teaching me in the way that I to, am to live. He, he gives life to and through my mortal body. And this life is living by the Spirit. He enables me, even though I'm in a mortal body and I'm not yet glorified, he enables me to live by the Spirit. He actually enables me to do what pleases him. This is the freedom of a Christian. He has freed me to receive his commandments not as the means by which I can get saved, but as the opportunity to freely serve him. 
He gives life to my mortal body, empowering me to obey God freely. And I, and I do this without a sense of I'm about to be condemned. I'm about to be sent to hell by a sin that I might commit. We're not talking about perfection, but we are talking about walking, walking by the Spirit in the freedom of a conscience and a heart that's been set free. And so he, by his Spirit, gives life into and through my mortal body so that I walk by the Spirit. So this is verses 12 to 17, living by the Spirit. So brothers, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Debtors. We're under obligation. Now, so far, we've been talking about the problem of obligation to the law, that if I don't fulfill, I'll be condemned condemned forever by the wrath of God. That's not the choice I put in the heading here. The heading I put is family obligation, not free choice. Because you see, 500 years since the Reformation, where we are today in the 21st century, is a lot of people, they don't think of themselves as sinners. They think of themselves as neutral. So the commands of God come to me as a neutral person. I can obey it or not because I'm neutral. And so I'm going to, you know, I have a free choice. I'm not saying that we're not free. I'm not saying this comes as determination. See, that's where most of the debate is, free will versus bondage of the will. So we can't do it and we can, you know, we're either free or not. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about imagining the Christian life as if we're just morally neutral people and we kind of, we can obey God or not obey God. I mean, today I will and tomorrow I won't and it doesn't matter because I'm a neutral person. This is not how the Christian life works. See that word debtor? We're debtors. But then it's not back to that old obligation of, uh, hey, I've got to obey this law or I'm going to lose uh any standing before God and I'll be condemned forever. It's not that debtor either. This is what I've called family obligation. See how Paul develops this? Look down at verse 14. You have to skip verse 13 in order to follow this, and we'll come back to verse 13. Verse 14. For, we're debtors. Why? For, verse 13, because all who... Um, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You've received the spirit of adoption of sons by whom you cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children, that sons of God. And by the way, Paul is using the word sons here, but he means men or women. The point is you have this standing here before God, like the standing of a son. Now, that's the obligation. What is family obligation? You ever um, feel the obligation? Well, we don't do that in our family. Um, we, need to, we need to do this because that's who we are in our family. Um, I do this because... That's who we are. Um, can I disobey my dad? Yeah, I can. I come to a point in child training, however, where, where I, 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 don't, I don't really want to do that because I have identity. I have identity in this family. And, and, and this is what our family is like. You see the point? We're, we're debtors, 
For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons. And we, we have received the spirit of adoption as sons. And, and the Holy Spirit, when we pray, it is the Spirit who's testifying with our own spirit. When we say Father, when we say Father, and we pray to him as Father, there is this internal testimony of the Holy Spirit confirming, that's right, that's right, he's our Father. We're his children. That's who we are. So we're debtors with a family obligation, Paul says. Now, this helps you to understand verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. This is not, this is not canceling out everything that Paul has said. And it's so, so difficult because people are, are thinking back to Romans 7. Okay. The best way to understand this <clears throat> is living according to the flesh is putting you back into that whole uh, quality of life of deadness. And guilt and deadness, and it's, it, it's a whole realm of living that you don't want to live in. But by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Notice how Paul does this poetically. Live, die, death, live. Live, die, die, live. Okay? There's this, we call it um, this um, X type of um, acrostic or, or um, contrast, um, chiastic structure. Live, die, die, live. This is a poetic way of saying it. People who live according to the flesh live in the whole realm of death. That's not who you are. By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body. And by the Spirit, you live in the resurrection of Christ. And that brings us, not only are we sons, but heirs. You're an heir. An heir. We receive the adoption of sons. We are children of God. But if we're children, we're also heirs. Heirs of God and heirs with Christ. You know the difference between a child and an heir? Okay? Every child is a child. There's really no difference. I mean, if you're a child, you're a child. If you're a son, you're a son. But heirs differ in terms of the amount of inheritance. They differ in terms of the allotment of the, they're all heirs, but the allotment of the inheritance, how much of the inheritance, that differs. And note this last phrase, provided we suffer with him in order that we may glor be glorified with him. That Paul will have to unpack somewhere else. All are sons, all are children, all are heirs, but the rewards, they differ. And so we need to walk with him. There is a freedom of a Christian. A freedom doesn't have the, the Christian doesn't have the, the burden of condemnation about to hit you at every corner, every turn. There's a possibility of losing it all. That's not what we have in Christ. In Christ, the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. There's no, there's no compulsion uh, of condemnation that's facing us in our walk with him, but rather there is an enlivening as we believe in Christ, trusting in him, in his death, the power of his death to say no to sin, the power of his life to say yes to that life by which he then empowers me to live like that. By faith, by exercising that faith, I walk with him 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, faith receiving that power, and I live in the freedom of a Christian. That is the blessing of Romans 8. Well, <clears throat> we come to the end of our time, and we have maybe a couple of moments here for um, questions, comments. Dr. Blazing? Yes, uh, Steve. I might step in. Uh, I think Dan Farrell's in the class, and he'd like to address everyone before we start losing some of our Zoom participants. Okay. Yes, Dan. Ah, this is where I go. <laughs> Thank you for such a glorious lesson, Dr. Blazing. Seems the best part of Romans 7 is that it's followed by Romans 8. Um, I um, understand that um, you uh, had a very nice and fitting tribute for Dr. Henry Morris uh, at the beginning of the class. I'm sorry I was late. I had some other business to attend to this morning, so I joined you in progress. Uh, but uh, I want to just amen your comments on that. Uh, Henry was a great friend and mentor to me and was an agent of spiritual growth for me. It's been my privilege to be a member of the ICR board and to get really uh, close to him over the years. And I do appreciate all of you and your prayers for uh, Jan. I uh, do have another bit of news uh, for those of you that uh, come in today from the Genesis class, and that is in, uh, uh, you will remember uh, our members, George and Joanne Neiman. Uh, I just learned in church this morning um, I, that uh, George also passed away yesterday suddenly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your prayers for Joanne at this time would be most appreciated. Heaven has gotten some really good deposits recently. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Blazing and Steve for the opportunity to just say a, a couple of words and uh, to welcome, uh, to express my excitement once again about the um, merger of these two great classes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dan. And we will certainly be praying for uh, Joanne and uh... Thank you for, for letting us know about that. And um, any, any comments or questions, anyone, before we conclude today? Yes. Just uh, feel free. Yes, Gabriel, I see that uh, hand there. Yes. <laughs> Oh, uh, Dr. Blazing, I forgot to say thank you to the class. Thank you for your prayers and for everything. I really appreciate it. So let me voice that out. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Blazing, I have a question for you. Yes, Mike. Um, at the beginning of your uh, lesson, you mentioned uh, Martin Luther and some writings that he did, and it's a I think it said 500th anniversary of those writings. Yes. And you recommended, I, I, it seemed like you mentioned three different writings, but I could be wrong, but you uh, recommended that everyone read something by him. What was that that you were recommending? Yes, the, uh, the thank you, Mike. The specific book is The Freedom of a Christian. The Freedom of a Christian. Um, uh, sometimes it's published under the title On Christian Liberty. Uh, the, the three books are sometimes published together. You can find them published together, uh, sometimes under the title The Three Treatises of Martin Luther, uh, addressed to the Christian nobility on the Babylonian captivity of the church and the freedom of a Christian. Uh, but it's that last one particularly. All three are interesting, uh, both historically and theologically, but that's it. It's probably not real light reading. Uh, it, it, you know, when you're reading something 500 years ago, it's a little different style. 
but uh, but the translators do try to uh, to make it. Uh, and actually, Freedom of a Christian reads very interestingly, and uh, I think I think you I think people enjoy it today reading it. Also, at the beginning of your lesson, you mentioned Moses uh, said to memorize Deuteronomy six. Uh, in, in, in Deuteronomy six, Moses tells them to um, to to memorize the law. He's he's telling them to to memorize it. Basically, they are to teach it to each other. He talks. There's that famous phrase where he talks about writing it on your uh, hands, on your you know your your coat, on the wall, on the gate you know everywhere so you're always seeing it and uh, always learning it and then at the end of deuteronomy deuteronomy 30 he says the law is in your heart right um that that's because he told them to to study it constantly so that's to memorize it but that's what they are to do and also psalm 1 talks about um, memorizing and meditating on the law of God. And Paul does not dispute the wonderful benefits that come from that. And even the way in which the law can, can educate your behavior, the problem is it will not uh, eradicate the indwelling sin. And that's where Paul goes, and that's that's what we have in Christ. Uh, so that power. memorization, that memorization, or at least familiarity with that, um, what he's mentioned in Deuteronomy six, and I think also thirty that you mentioned, uh, is that applicable to us as Christians? Yes, Mike, it is. Um, and, and Paul, I do believe, um, if we brought him in here, he would say, to answer your question specifically, say, oh, yeah, you, you need to memorize and meditate on Scripture. How does he say it in Romans? He says it where he says the law is good. The law is good. He says that several times. And in Romans 7, the problem was not the law itself. The problem is indwelling sin. Now, what we'll find is um, going on in Paul, he talks about you, you memorize scripture, you learn the teaching, but it's the spirit who enables you to walk in accordance with that word. So it's not, it's not against learning the scripture. It's not against memorizing scripture. All of that is good. We just need we need the power of Christ in order to live it. That's the point that Paul is making. Um, I was watching uh, TV yesterday. I just have broadcast TV. I don't have cable or UVerse or direct or anything like that. And on channel 8-3, there was a travel show and it was real interesting. It was all about the Greek gods. It wasn't a religious show at all but I didn't realize there were so many gods back in uh, ancient Greece. Yes, that's true. Um, and, and with none of that, <laughs> is there any empowerment for life? That's Paul's point. <laughs> there are many today also. Yeah, indeed, there are. Other uh, comments, questions? Uh, uh, can I yeah, have time to ask? This is Mary Helen, and um, I just wanted to uh, thank Wanda for the updates that she gives us on Mark Taylor. Uh, I didn't know him, but his father, Paul Taylor, used to come, he would come by the Media Resource Center uh, on Sundays, and he was always enjoyable to speak to. But uh, also, as we're praying for Mark, um, I I'm glad that Wanda provided the address uh, for Rebecca, uh, for his wife. And during this time of the year, we're giving to people that we know personally and everything. I, I think it's a 
good opportunity for us to remember Mark and Rebecca uh, with a, a financial gift of uh, is any amount I'm sure they would appreciate. And uh, this is a special time that, that we are able to give to others. Thank you, Mary Helen, for that word. Thank you for Wanda for keeping us apprised. Um, many of us uh, have known Paul Taylor, a wonderful uh, evangelist, uh, just a wonderful minister, servant of the Lord, and um, grateful for Paul and um, praying for Mark. And thank you, Mary Helen, for that, for that uh, encouragement to help with uh, financial needs, I'm sure. They yes. Are. Thank you. I know the family is struggling financially, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, next question, or yes, go ahead, Steve. Uh, before we sign off, I'd just like to have, ask you to uh, say a word about our intention for next Sunday. Yes, well, thank you. Fun. Yeah. Yes, so next Sunday, uh, December 20th, uh, our plan is to teach from the classroom. So um, we have uh, Carol and, and, and Dan and Linda and, and, and others there in the classroom today. But our plan is to, uh, I plan to be there in the classroom. As many of you who want to join us in the room, we welcome you back to the classroom. We will be teaching from there and uh, sending it out on Zoom. Our capable IT team of, of uh, Rody, Develing, and Cashman and uh, will, will help us here. And those of you who want to continue connecting on Zoom, y'all feel free to do that. All who can come to the classroom to do that. We look forward to fellowshipping uh, with you there, um, however you're able to attend the class. That is our plan for next Sunday. This is a big room. It's got uh, one, two, three, four, five. It's got a 16 big round tables so we can properly social distance. And, uh, and so you'll be, uh, you'll be very safe in this room. So I'm, I have a great deal of confidence in here and everyone is masked up except me. And uh, that's, um, but that's a good thing. So uh, there's plenty of room, and by the way, we even have a piano in here, so I just, this was a new addition to today. I'm not sure who did that, but thank you for that, uh, for that, uh, that addition. All right, well, very good. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming together today. Thank you for the time in, in prayer together, and thank you for the time in God's Word. Um, let us walk with the Lord uh, according to uh, the Spirit. Maybe walk by the Spirit uh, in this week. We continue to pray for our nation. Um, remember, the Lord is in control, and uh, we pray that He will accomplish uh, His purposes, and uh, we will continue to serve Him. And um, Thank you all for the friendship that we have in this class, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Let me pray for us as we close. Father, thank you for this time and your word. Thank you for the great truths that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, grant us wisdom in our walk with you. Lord, please grant your favor as we walk with you this week. May the Lord be honored in it all, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good week. Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. All right.